Joshua Tree is vast and otherworldly. I think that's what really draws people here. Even many of the people who built homesteads here, they came from working class Los Angeles, from mining and other places. And what kept them here, what kept them coming back, I think, was to be in connection with that otherworldly environment. And I think that's what so many people love about this place. Well, this work at Joshua Tree National Park relates to a historic resources study that the National Park Service commissioned us at UCR to do. And the goal of the research is to identify the private property holdings that have been part of Joshua Tree, first when it was a historic monument, and now it's a national park. And so our study is about the homesteads and inholdings at the park. We're looking at, well, what have been the property relations and what does that mean for who's come here, why, how have they made it or not made it, right? And as we go through some of the sites that are part of the study that we've done, you'll notice that there are a number of sites that are somewhat in ruins and that have their own stories of development in the West. This property behind me, well, it goes by a lot of names. Gone by the Bagley House, the Olson House, the Pink House, Olson's Health Food Store, and Wonderland Ranch. This was purchased in the mid-1930s by a man named Worth Bagley. He was a uh, retired Los Angeles County Sheriff. He lived out here for a while, and from all accounts, he was a pretty irascible figure. He actually tried to ambush and kill his neighbor, Bill Keyes. That did not work out well. Bill Keyes was a better shot and had a rifle in his car and dispatched Worth Bagley. The park was approached by Warner Brothers Studios. They were doing a movie called There Was a Crooked Man. This was a Western. And in the movie, they wanted to reconstruct the Yuma, Arizona territorial prison. And they asked the park if they could do that in the Pinto Basin. And the park agreed in exchange for Warner Brothers making a sizable donation to support the park. So this Pinto Basin has been an interesting place in the 1960s for Hollywood, for this movie set that was constructed. We're standing in front of a house that had been owned by the Cases, and they had purchased the land and built this house in 1953. And when they purchased the house, it came from another family called the Whitlows. And so the Whitlows had purchased this property from the railroad and they built the home and they did it with kind of love and care and a really high degree of craftsmanship. And this property is intended to become an educational resource center at some point in the future. If you ask somebody in 1910, what's the appeal of Joshua Tree? They might say, I get lucky, I can find some gold. By the time we get to the 1930s, the appeal is LA is not what was promised when we left the Midwest. The appeal in the 1950s, late 1940s is freeways are being built. Cities are blowing up. This isn't the state that I grew up in. I want to get away from civilization. And then the appeal now, there's something undeniably magic. The alchemy of the rocks, the sun. This idea of vacationing in the desert is a very recent idea. We can really go to the 1990s before vacationing in places like Joshua Tree is seen as something that fancy people want to do. These days, my understanding is Joshua Tree is one of the most visited parks in the nation after Yosemite and Grand Canyon and these really famous parks. Riverside is the largest research university, the closest one to Joshua Tree National Park. And national parks actually run on a very small, almost skeletal staff. And so even a national park as big as Joshua Tree has to reach out to universities through grants and other collaborative projects to do the research to support the park. That basic understanding of the historic context helps inform why these places, like Joshua Tree specifically, matter, right? Why they matter to the nation, because they're part of a National Park Service, why they matter to the larger stories of how we've settled the land. And over the course of these, you know, several hundred years, it's a process by which Native people were displaced from the land. The ways in which we've used the land as a commodity to make a living, the ways in which those commodities have then been used for touristic or entertainment or sports and recreation purposes. Thinking about climate 
and how this landscape has changed over the course, and especially for our study, the course of human interactions with the landscape itself. And what I've realized is we have all these stories, famous stories like Bill Keyes shooting Worth Bagley out on the road out here. Those capture all of the sort of headlines. But the stories I think are wonderful are the fact that people helped each other out. They knew each other, they took care of each other's kids. I like telling stories about everyday people, people like me, people like maybe my family members or my friends, the people that aren't gonna necessarily be remembered in the annals of history. I think that's what good history does, is it tells the story of, of everyday folks.